Well, hello, beautiful ones. I am Stacy Murphy, the head Vixen of the Vixen Academy, and I am joined here with Diana Escadar. And what happens is we are bringing you this training today where we are going to, well, actually, we're going to be sharing with you how you can go from sabotage to secure, right? So that you can be open to receiving a man's love so you do not push him away. Now, before we jump into uh, the training, because it is a joint training, we're going to have part one and part two of the training, but really where this all came about, I just want to kind of ground everyone. You know, we had um, a, a summit uh, in April called uh, 12 Days of Juicy Love, and Diana was one of the guests in the summit, and we had such a tremendous response. People asking us, when are you going to have a part B? When are you going to come back? And things of that nature. So guess what? We listened to you. Mm -hmm. And here we are. And what happens with the summit, you just, it was just one sided. You heard what we had to say. We share that information with you, but we did really hear from a lot of you wanting to go a little bit deeper and to be able to ask us questions and to get coaching. So this is why the two of us are here with you today in a more intimate um, environment uh, and things of that nature. So with that said, why don't uh, we go ahead and get jumping into everything that we were talking about? And one of the things, well, Diana, first of all, I know I've been doing a lot of the talking initially. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would love for you to uh, lend your energy before we even jump into bios yeah. and doing formal introductions. So that I would just be want to say hello to all the ladies and thank you for joining us live. I know some of you will also be watching the replay, which is amazing, but we're just really excited to share and continue the conversation and there was a lot of beautiful feedback too when we when I was sharing about this event that Stacy and I were going to do together and you seem really excited on this topic so we have a lot of goodies planned for you today so let's dive in oh and I wanted to mention Stacy because a lot of people get my last name wrong Iskander <laughs> Thank you for doing that because it's just like people spell my name wrong, my first name wrong all the time, right? I can and imagine stuff like that. Oh yeah, and I call I get called Tracy. That's a that's another one that's there. So let me go ahead. This will be a perfect time for me to go and introduce Miss Diana, who is here with us today, right? Because Diana is going to actually kick things off. So Diana Eskander, right, <laughs> is an expert love coach and founder of the School of Love, right? And Diana helps hundreds of women, and she has helped hundreds of women from around the world, you know, meet their matches and access just deeper levels of love you know, in their existing relationships. And she's recently been named. And here's the interesting thing. This is something else the two of us have in common, not only being in North America, but Diana was also recently named as top two love coach in Yahoo. She's been selected as a TEDx speaker. She's been featured on global TV, as well as being a contributor to Thrive, right? And making her the reference, right? The reference for women who crave to really look for a different approach to love. You know, one that gets them out of their heads and into their hearts, right? And so this is definitely why we're having this discussion because sabotage, head, heart, right? And yeah. so getting in there. So that is what Diana brings uh, to our conversation, our training uh, today. And I'd love to introduce you, Stacy. Uh, Stacy is your love and intimacy coach, who's better known as Queen of Juicy Love. <laughs> I love it. In 2021, Stacy was listed on Yahoo Top 10 Love Coaches to look out for. So, as we mentioned, we were sisters alongside that. Stacy considers herself a recovered perfectionist who is slaying life the hard way with masculine energy, which we're totally going to touch on today. And now Stacy teaches professional women how to enjoy life the easy way, coming from their feminine power by feeling strong seductive and charismatic in the presence of high caliber men. And through the seven pillars of her quality man GPS system, women learn how to attract and maintain a happy and juicy relationship that will stand the test of time. So good. Okay, so with that, I'd love to kick us off um, with talking a little bit about sabotage today. So I've written some notes, so you'll see me looking down and, and that's the reason why I wanna make sure I hit all the points today. And one of the things that I really want to talk about was sabotage, which may come maybe almost unexpectedly, unless you've kind of read into what we're going to speak about today, is how women actually overgive, overthink, and overdo in relationships. And 
in, in some ways we can almost summarize that as like overperforming in your relationships. What I really want to start with saying is that giving is a masculine energy, but now let me just like before your mind jumps to any places, giving in that really um, action oriented way is a masculine energy. And there's nothing wrong with masculine energy. In fact, it's really powerful for us to know how to play with the two. That being said, I've seen this now and, and I really consider it like a deep rooted problem that we have this idea flipped on its head that the feminine energy is one of giving. And what I'd really like to, to distinguish here is that the feminine energy is one among many things, among many qualities for both masculine and feminine is nurturing. And there's a distinction to be made there. Giving is more of an action Nurturing is more of a way of being. It's a feeling that we exude and that people feel around us. And we've really had this wrong for a very long time. I don't know about you, but I witnessed my mother doing everything. She was the breadwinner. She, she's like cooking, cleaning, knows all of our friends' names, doing things for my father. It was, it was a model that I really witnessed. And I know many women that I've worked with and just women all around, like this is a model we know well, right? So we have this idea that to be in relationship is almost like we are, we are putting on our doing hats. We're in our performance mode and we've got to make it happen. We've got to think about the ways to keep the relationship strong. We've got to make the plans, plan the dates, initiate all the tough conversations, you know, make sure our relationships stay sexy. Like we think we have to do all the things we think about our partners all the time, about our relationships. It's, it's, it's exhausting. <laughs> I'm exhausted just listing it all out. <laughs> I know. So the more, and here's, and here's really the, um, the, the, the catch 22 is like the more we actually go into that energy of proving ourselves, proving that you're a good partner, proving that you're a good girlfriend, proving you could be a great wife, for example, right? Like I can cook all the dinners. I'm great with kids. I'm super sociable. I'm perfect, right? Like see me, notice me. The more we go into that space, the less he can see you. I really want you to hear that. The less he can see you because in some ways, without even noticing it, and totally unconsciously and unintentionally, you're in competition with his masculine. Okay, I really want you to hear that because I want this to be a full permission to slip to relax. <laughs> And then the less he sees you, the less you feel appreciated. Right? So then we get into this loop. I don't know about you, but this is how I navigated my relationships through my early teens into my 20s. I was there. I was there. I was available. What do you need? Right? Like, I'm here. I love you. I'm your ride or die. I'm here for whatever. Forget my needs. Like, I'm here for what you need. And that did not get me far. It got me a lot of heartache. They could not see me. They could not appreciate me because I wasn't in that space for myself. I was not. So then what happened? So, so we get in this loop, right? So we're trying to prove ourselves, which makes him unable to see you, which then makes you feel unappreciated. So you're going to do one of two things in most cases or a combination of both. You're going to try harder, a reaction that's rooted in fear, or you're going to feel resentful, also very much rooted in fear. So if we think about emotions on a spectrum, fear is at the bottom of that emotional spectrum and resentment somewhere like floating very close above it. And we've got love all the way up here as the highest frequency. There's a big gap. 
So I want, what I want you to hear loud and clear is that if you've ever done this, if this is your way of being, if you witness this in the women around you, this overperforming and overdoing and overthinking in relationships, it's actually not love. And I hope that that's not too hard for some of you to hear, okay? It's, it, those are actions rooted in fear. And I just wanna say this piece here. This is very unconscious, okay? And again, I'm hoping that this gives you a full permission slip. But while as women, we are unconsciously looking to see how a man shows up for us, he is unconsciously looking to see how you show up for yourself. Big one, take that one in. Because that means you get to redirect your focus when you are in relationship with someone to actually really make sure your cup is full first and foremost. What does it mean to show up for yourself? You have boundaries and you stick to them. You have a balanced life that includes him and yet isn't all about him. You know what you want and you have the courage to speak your desires. You take your time getting to know someone before deciding he's the one. You value him, you value yourself more. And again, this is a journey I'm very familiar with. I was the fixer in my family. I took on this role in all of my relationships and, and they could never really appreciate me. The only, the only relationship that I turned that around in was my last relationship, which is the one that I'm in with my husband. It was the first relationship that I flipped that around and really saw myself stand in this place of total worthiness. Okay, and so this is a short segment today. So we're just going to touch on some of the key points. That is a whole journey in and of itself to get into that place. So the underlying reason that we overgive, overthink, and overdo, essentially perform, we have these core belief systems, right? We have these core beliefs that are rooted in fear. So some of them might be, and you can see which one kind of like pings you in your body and resonates as true for you. I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. I must prove my worth. I have to make him stay. And these beliefs actually point to an anxious attachment. Okay, so what happens when we're in that, and I wanna be mindful of the time, I have so much I can say. What happens when we're in that is that when we're in that anxious place, we actually magnify avoidant tendencies in people. So if you can just even think for a moment, if you know anyone in your life who kind of operates from an anxious place and tries really hard to get your attention, like whether it's a friend or a family member, or a lover or a past lover, what was, what was your reaction to that? So when we have these belief systems of, for example, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, which is deeply rooted in most women that I work with. Right. And in and, and myself, too, it, it comes up from time to time. That's going to push out a thought pattern, which is going to motivate or sorry, create like trigger feelings in your body. Right. A feeling of insecurity, a feeling of um, doubt, worry, shame, guilt. And then those feelings start to inform your actions. So you text a little more, or you call a little more, or you bring up conversations out of left field because you're wrapped in your anxiety. And he's not quite sure how to hold all that, especially because typically this is a different version of the woman he met. Tracy, I saw so, Tracy. Oh my God, you planted that seed. Stacy, <laughs> I can see this is resonating with you. You're feeling this, I'm so glad. I definitely know your name is Stacy. Um, <laughs> so we just need to see that we're in a loop, right? So we just need to acknowledge, okay, I'm in a loop. When I'm in this space of acting from fear and I'm, I'm really actually just sabotaging this connection. 
Because I keep trying, the more I try, the less he can see me, the more frustrated and resentful I feel. Equally true at any stage in a relationship. So how do we stop? That's the big question, right? Like, how do we stop this sabotage? So the first thing is I, I love to, to pay attention to the body and notice how you feel. So when you are in a space of, oh, I'm gonna make dinner for him tonight, or I'm gonna pick up the phone and call, or let me buy this dress or whatever it might be, just notice your body. What is the feeling and the intention behind this action? Like really notice what is the motivation there? Is it like inspiration and joy and you're feeling totally in your power? Or is it like, I got to, I got to try something here. I felt him slipping away. I got to pull him back in. And when you notice that you're doing that, right? Redirect, redirect that action, put down the phone, put down the dress, put down the spatula, like put it down <laughs> and just acknowledge, like go to, go to yourself and acknowledge the feeling that you're having. Okay. This is my fear coming up that I am not enough and tend to that place. Love on that belief like pour love onto her because that is what she needs in that moment. And again, your cup fills up. He starts to see you and notice you more. Everybody wins. And ask yourself, what boundaries do I need to put in place? Maybe it's spending a few nights alone in the week. Right, like that was one of the things when I met Jack, who's my husband, it was like, I'm super excited about you. I think you're amazing. And I also need, know that I need some nights alone to talk to my friends or see my friends or be by myself or read or journal or watch a movie or take a walk or whatever it might be. Like, these are the things that I need to stay feeling grounded and not get completely swept away. Maybe it's putting your phone away for certain periods of the day. Right, putting some parameters around that, like not allowing yourself to stalk his social media, let's say if you're earlier in the game in a relationship. Only, only allowing yourself to commit to someone who's just as ready to commit to you, for example. If you're further in a relationship, not booking his appointments for him, right? For, for example, I've seen that one quite a few times. Creating some boundaries around yourself. So it's like, okay, these are my tendencies. These are maybe the things that I've also witnessed in my mother or my mother's mother or the women around me. And, I, and I've just assumed this is the way we need to be in relationship as women, but I wanna move from giving to nurturing. So from doing to just being, and this takes a lot of work. I, I wanna also acknowledge that this takes a lot of practice. And ultimately the space you really wanna step into is this space of receivership. If we were in like a, if you know, we will chat afterwards, but I'd be really curious to hear from you all who is familiar with receiving in their relationships. So if you were even to now, just like lean back into your chair Notice how it feels in your body if you're to lean back. So let me just do it here. And like open your heart, extend your arms and just feel that feeling of not having to do. How does it feel in your body? Does it feel good? Does it feel unfamiliar? Does it feel safe or unsafe? Relaxing, exciting, uneasy? If you really like practice, like I, I really encourage you when you want to actually sense within yourself, am I doing too much? Ask yourself, how much have I been leaning forward versus leaning back? And actually physically lean back and, and see how your body kind of reacts at this. will give you a good sense 
with your comfort level and, and or desire to let go of all the doing. And when you do that, when you lean back a little instead of forward, forward is good. We need that balance. We also, we're, we're here to do, we're here to create, right? There's, we, we balance those energies within ourselves, the masculine and feminine. The only way Stacy and I can show up today is to actually like put some things in place and get it done. And I have a few notes, but then in between, I'm letting my, my feminine take over and just take me wherever she wants to go. And when you do that, you let your partner step up and also come to you as well, right? Like you give him the space to show up in his masculine and or you're going to, to attract someone who is ready to do that. If you are an overgiver, I have no doubt that you are surrounded by takers. It's just how it goes. It's the yin and the yang. That person's gonna compliment you. So I want you to find a literal place in your body, like an actual place in your body where you can feel even the slightest sense of worthiness. And for some of you, it'll be way more than a slight sense and anchor into that daily. Like find that place in your body. I use, my, I use the body a lot in my work to really feel what it feels like to sit in your seat and be, and you just are worthy. This is how we stop the sabotage. There are many ways in which we sabotage relationships and we're just focusing on, that. I'm focusing on this one right here. Being in your feminine energy of receivership. So one of the qualities of the feminine is really to receive. This is your true power, but we've, we've never quite heard it this way. We've never quite witnessed it in this way. But it really gives him a chance to rise in his masculine. So rather than doing all the initiating, you can do some, let him come to you as well. Rather than doing all of the planning, you can do some, let him plan as well. Rather than doing all of the taking care of, let him take care of what he needs to take care of. We don't need to move into the role of mother. Nurturer is a feeling. It's a feeling that people get when they are around you. And it is because your own cup is overflowing. And I just want you to take a moment before we wrap it up here to really reflect on how you ever been around someone who gives so much, it actually makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> and just take that in. How do you feel around that person who you feel is like, you don't really ever call them, but they're always calling you. You don't really ever think of doing things for them, but they're always thinking of doing things for you. And look at the dynamic that's been created there. So, so much of what we do in relationship that we get frustrated about, we actually create ourselves, at least a part of the dynamic. We at least have a 50% of it, right? And they have their own 50%. So I wanted to just wrap it up there for us to really think about, okay, this is, this is the sabotage of overgiving in relationships, especially as women. And I know Stacy has a lot to share about some of the ways that we, um, some of the, the reasons or the ways that relationships fail. So I wanna leave it for you, Stacy, to take it from here and just share with us all the goodness that you have. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Diana. Um, what a lot of people are going to hear, uh, you're probably gonna hear some uh, similar things and you're going to see them from different perspectives yeah. uh, of, of how we of how we come so definitely we want you to take some notes and like I said if you were able to download the workbook uh, that I provided that would be great um, and because I want to jump on into it now so when Diana was talking about um, in terms of the uh, the pushing and being very much understanding the feminine and the masculine energy and how it's showing up 
in our relationship, I that really touches on one of the top reasons that relationships fail, right? And so I really want you everyone to be aware of what the top three reasons are why relationships fail. Because if you understand that, either if you're looking for a new relationship, right? If you're uh, wanting to attract a new relationship into your life, or if you already have a partner in your life, it, the energies will still, it'll still work the same way. So the top three reasons relationships fail are incompatibility is the number one reason. Um, if we're going to talk about statistics, almost like 40, 45, 50% is incompatibility. And some of you may go, well, if you're married to someone or if you're in a relationship with someone, you should be compatible <laughs> with, with that person. That's not the type of compatibility that we're talking about here. The type of compatibility that we're talking about is, do you, are you healthy, whole, and complete going into the relationship? Because if you're healthy, whole, and complete going into the relationship, you clearly know who you are, right? And then the other part of the compatibility piece is, do you understand, the truly understand the person that you're in the relationship with going beyond just okay, here's his birthday, here are the things that he likes or dislikes. Do you understand his nature as a man? Which also then requires you to understand your nature as a woman, right? And so that is, that's the number one. Then the other two reasons why relationships fail are money and sex. So this goes into people not having sexual, healthy sexual uh, attitude going into a relationship, um, having bad boundaries going into the relationship people holding and harboring money fears going into the relationship. And so the reason why we're bringing this up is if when you heal those issues currently right here, right now, they will not blow up in your relationship because relationships just only exacerbate something that may not be working necessarily within your own life. So those are the top three reasons. And now here's how kind of in terms of the money, um, not money, but in terms of the love space, I have money on my mind, but in terms of the love space that we're in, um, I use something called the four pillars of love, where that is how a relationship can be sustainable for that can stand the test of time. And those four pillars of love actually show up differently in men as they do with women. So here are those four pillars. The first one is mental. The second pillar is emotional. The third pillar is physical. And then the fourth pillar is sexual, right? Now, a woman's comfort zone, right, is mental and emotional because a lot of that is really governed by our estrogen. So you're also going to get a biology lesson here because what's also um, really important to understand, ladies, is to really understand your nature and to really understand the nature of men, because that is also where sabotage plays in. I'm gonna share that more specifically. But mental and emotional is a woman's comfort zone. This is why a lot of women are like, what do you feel about me? How do you feel? This is also why a lot of women um, really fall into the sabotage trap of overthinking. <laughs> this is also where that comes from. So we wanna kind of give you an idea where that is coming from, because if you're not sure where it's coming from, you don't know what to adjust change or shift, right? So in a man's comfort zone is physical and sexual. And the reason why that is, that's actually driven by testosterone. That's biologically driven. A lot of women get really upset about it because they think, oh, that's all men care about is sex. And they feel that it's something that they're just focused in there. It's purposely focused that way and they don't care about anything else. But what I wanna share with you is testosterone is responsible for sexual attraction. Testosterone is responsible for arousal. Testosterone is what actually makes man have muscles, have the voice, have the height and everything that they have, right? And so this is why sometimes it feels that men have sex on the brain, right? But that's not necessarily true, right? That's an assumption that we all make. So I wanted to kind of clarify that because here it's one, Women, it's about grounding the mental and emotional. And it's also about from the emotional also to heal that as well. And then with men, with the physical and the sexual, it's about grounding that as well so that it can be healthy in a relationship. Because here's how the four pillars of love work in a relationship long-term. Like right now I'm sitting on a four-legged chair, right? 
I'm sitting on a four-legged chair. So think of the four pillars of love in a very similar way. All right. So then the other thing around that, you would then go, you sat on a wonky chair, right? And it still sustains you. You can still sit on it, right? That's how the four pillars of love are. The four pillars don't have to be even. Just here's what's important. A pillar can't be broken. Just like if you were to sit on a chair and one of the legs is broken, a four-legged chair, if the leg is broken, what's going to happen? You're going to fall right off of it. It won't sustain you. The four pillars of love works the same exact way. If one of those pillars is broken, your relationship will not be sustainable long-term. So the first thing I'd like all of you to do is evaluate which one of those pillars in your life is broken. Which one of those pillars has a really big deficit and you need to make some deposits in your love bank to fill it back up so you can repair that leg, right? So here's how I want you to think. And so one of the things if you have the workbook, I want you to turn to the next page. I want you to think, how have you been sabotaging your relationships? That's the first part of your awareness is how have you been sabotaging your relationships? Because two people are in a relationship, not one person. It's not always the other person that did this, that, and the other as to why the relationship may not be going well if you're currently in a relationship. And if you're not in a relationship, why it may have uh, departed, right? And so really look at what was your role in that because that is what you have the control to change. That is the only thing you have control over are your own actions, your own thinking and your own way of feeling and being, right? So now that we're kind of anchored in why relationships fail, the four pillars of love. What I am gonna be focusing on though is the very first pillar, right? And because that's what we have time for uh, today is really to focus on the very first pillar, which is the mental part, where I call mental power, but also when it comes in a relationship, this is what sets ladies, this is what sets you up to be a man's confidant, is when you have really crystal, crystal clear mind power and you've eliminated the sabotaging behavior. So let's kind of jump into why also it's important to get into a man's head, because that's also where a lot of sabotage is connected to. And the reason why that is, is when it comes to men and the four pillars of love in terms of getting to a man's commitment, the first stop is mental. So it's mind power so you can be a man's confidant. And then the second part of that is your sex appeal, right? And so you can be a man's sex symbol and that's the outer essence and you're working the two together. But when you can get into a man's head, that is how you can get into his heart because through the mind, you're taking, your, you're taking the man on a journey. So what journey do you wanna take him on? And your behavior will determine the behavior, determine the journey that you take the man on. So if you are living in negative self-defeating thoughts where a sabotage comes from, what kind of journey are you taking that man on from that, right? And Diana had talked about some of those key issues that was there. So I want you to think about what journey are you taking him on? Now, when you are healthy, whole and complete, and you understand your nature and the nature of men, and you can confidently engage with men, you're doing those mental breadcrumbs is what I call it. What kind of journey are you then taking that man on? It's gonna be a totally different journey that you're taking those men on. And so the ones that are taking the man on a positive journey because they understand their own nature of coming from their feminine power and understanding a man's nature coming from his masculine, you both can actually show up in a very powerful way that is in alignment with your nature versus going against it. And that is also where a lot of sabotage is coming from. So this is why it's important to get into a man's head because it determines the journey that you're gonna be taking that man on. And then the journey that you take that man on is how he remembers how he feels when he is in your presence, all right? So all of this is really important. So let's kind of focus now on that sabotage, that sabotage bucket, okay? So in my world, when I'm, um, I use a lot of analogies. <laughs> I use a lot of analogies when, when I'm uh, training and coaching so people can really understand some of these higher concepts. So in my world, sabotage, there are two, there are two sides to sabotage, okay? And so one, sabotage is 50% coming from you, 
right? And that will look at the first thing comes from a lack of self-awareness, right? And a lack of self-awareness and also resistance from healing any issues or pain or trauma drama that's coming from the past and replaying the past over and over. So that's one part of, of sabotage. The other part of sabotage is not understanding men and the other half of what's in the union because there are two people in this relationship, not just one person. So sabotage comes from what are things that you may be doing to take yourself out of the game, but then the other part of it is you understand the, the individual and the nature of the person that you're interacting with. All right, so let's focus on right now this first part, which is about you and what's driving that, okay? So one of the things that drives around what I say, the lack of self-awareness, it's driven by three things in particular, right? So I want you to write these down. So it's driven by three things in particular. The first thing is driven by mental and emotional pain, mental and emotional pain that's coming from the past. And it's pain that's being relived in the present. And because you're replaying that pain in the present, like a tape recorder in your head, it's then affecting the results that you're getting in the future, right? So that's the first component to it. The second component to this is not accepting your true nature. And in this case, we're talking not accepting your true nature as a woman right? Because feminine energy and masculine energy feels very different. So very, very quickly, I'm going to share with you what they, what they feel like differently. So that way you can do an assessment of, oh, okay, now I know that I'm in my masculine energy, all right? Because it's very easy for us to say, oh, be in your feminine energy, not be in your masculine energy. And when we go, well, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> what does that even feel like? So here's what feminine energy um, looks and feel like. So feminine energy is um, gentle power, okay? It's open, it's welcoming, it's inviting, it's being, okay? So feminine energy is being. Feminine energy feels very fluid like water, all right? Very fluid like water. Feminine energy is also vulnerable, okay? I'm gonna, I'll talk about that in a minute. So feminine energy is also being vulnerable. Feminine energy is also seductive. All right. Feminine energy is also, I think I already said it's, it's welcoming and it's inviting, but feminine energy is also nurturing. That is what feminine energy looks and feels like. Now, masculine energy is rigid power. Masculine energy is doing, it's pushing, it's projecting. Masculine energy is very defensive. It's also predatorial. Masculine energy is also about structure and masculine energy is very fiery right? Very fiery, okay? That's what masculine energy feels like. So you can see that you can actually, from those two different descriptions, you can see how they feel differently. Now, the visual that I want you to have in your head of how the two energies work together, think of the yin-yang symbol, right? The yin-yang symbol, that is a perfect representation of how those energies play together. And I want you to start playing with this energy, practicing with this energy, because that's another feedback that as coaches we get uh, from a lot of men and that we also see women are way too serious when it comes to relationships. It's like they're job hunting when it comes for a relationship and it takes all of the fun out of being with your partner. Then when you're in the relationship with your man, it's all this doing, 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 and you are literally pushing the relationship forward. And that's controlling energy. And that is from a lack of trust that your partner will do their part, right? That's what that comes from. So, and if you experience power struggles in your relationships, it's because you have a lot of masculine energy that's showing up in your relationship. So there are two men that are trying to be in the relationship and that's where that power struggle comes from, right? So the other thing, the second part, like I say, is really understanding, but accepting. After you understand your nature, then you have to accept it, all right? And then the third component to that is you're, and this is something that a lot of us are not aware of, why, what's driving this lack of self-awareness. The third component of that is your body, your physical body has gotten addicted to stress hormones because we in our society have gotten caught in this flight and, uh, fight and flight, right, response. And back in the day, 
it's in our primitive brain. Back in the day, it was because we had to save ourselves from dinosaurs and all this other stuff. So yes, we had that fight or flight um, mentality where the stress hormone is triggered. What are some of the stress hormones? Some of the stress hormones are adrenaline. Uh, stress hormone is cortisol. These, these are what's firing off in your body. This is how these, those same hormones, stress hormones are being fried off in our modern society, which is keeping you stuck in lack of self-awareness. Do you watch the news? <laughs> right? That's one of the big things. Do you watch the news? It's always bad news, right? I don't even know why they call it the news because it's really more propaganda. But what happens is if you're a person that watches the news all the time, your body has gotten addicted to those stress hormones and it's almost like you need a fix. And so this is what takes people out of their awareness, all right? And so what happens is this creates that familiar pattern that you many times you go, why do I keep doing the same action? Or why do I keep attracting the same type of person? Why do I keep finding myself in the same situation? Have any of you ever said that to yourselves? Because I know when I was all in my masculine energy, I kept asking myself that same question. And part of it was because I got stuck in that loop of being addicted to the stress hormone. So I was always chasing after that same familiar feeling, whether it worked for me or not. And this is what subconsciously we do to ourselves to sabotage ourselves, right? And so I want you to keep that in mind. And so here's what you would do in order to shift right? In order to actually do that pattern shift, because this is a pattern, right? It is a pattern. And anything that is a pattern, it comes from a habit. And anything that's a habit can be changed. That means it's not set in stone. So here's how you can actually start to shift that pattern. And it focuses on two kind of key components. The first component is really focusing on your self-worth. Right? And I know Diana touched on that a little bit as well, because self-worth is how you value yourself on the inside and how you value yourself on the inside is how a man and other people are going to value you. So here are words on valuing yourself on your inside. Um, do you feel you're more than enough? Right? So if you value yourself on the inside, you feel that you're more than enough. If you value yourself on the inside, you know that you have something positive to contribute to a relationship, a situation, whatever the case may be. If you value yourself in a relationship, what happens is you have the confidence to communicate your needs, wants, desires, including your frustrations, right? These are all signs of when you value yourself. When you value yourself in a relationship, you're able to come to that person, especially if there's a disagreement, and you're able to deal with it constructively without blame, without the blame game going on. You're looking for a solution versus doing the blame game, right? So those are all ways of looking at your self-worth, right? So the other part of shifting this pattern is then also focusing on your self-image. Your self-image is how you project your value to other people. That's how you project your value and how you project your value to other people is how they will treat you, right? So self-worth is how other people will value you. Self-image is how other people will treat you, right? And they both work together because self-worth is an inner game and self-image is an outer game. And they work together like you weaving a, a web, right? Which I loved in Sexual Bewitchery, the, the authors call the web woman's energetic body. That is what you're actually weaving, all right? And they work together that way. And so what happens is here's how you can heighten your self-worth. Because I do want to give you a couple of things that you can um, go away with. And then we're going to have our Q&A um, momentarily. And we're going to share with you as well ways that you can even go deeper with this. But in terms of how you can actually um, heighten your self-awareness, one is understanding your own true nature, your own beingness, not doingness, but your beingness. So an example of that, accepting your true nature, I am an introvert, okay? And growing up, I believed, oh, in order to get anything you want, in order to be noticed, you have to be an extrovert in order to do that. So growing up, I was trying so much to be like an extrovert. 
And guess what? It did not work. It was very fake. It was very phony. So what happened is people were feeling that energy and I was not receiving the treatment or having the relationships that I wanted. And when I finally learned to accept being an introvert, that's when my world started to turn because I was then emphasizing my positive qualities versus trying to stuff it down thinking that something was wrong or bad with being an introvert. So that is one of the things about accepting your nature versus fighting it. Because what happens is when you accept your nature, you feel calm, you feel light, you're also welcoming. And this is how we will feel in your body. And this is how we'll feel to other people as well. All right. Then the other thing is when you're in your nature, right? It is something that has been with you for a lifetime. That's the other way you can tell if something is your nature. It's been a thread in your life for whatever. So just like what's also in my nature is I have this, I don't know, I have this particular honor code or ethics. And sometimes it actually has gotten me into trouble because I would assume, why can't other people be that way? They should have the same ethics and honor and all this other stuff. I'm just projecting my stuff on them. I'm trying, I want them to be like how I am, which is not fair, right? So how many of us do that in our, in our relationships? So what happened with that one was, it was about, um, I was like, why, why, what's up with this? So I was trying to push that down and, and say, I just need to be a little bit more of a bad girl, right? And things of that nature. And that also was going against my nature. And my mom told me, it's like, girl, she, my mom said, you've been like this ever since you were two. I'm like, seriously? She's like, yeah, you've been like this since you were two years old. And so when my mom told me that, I was like, this is part of my nature. It's, and so to accept that and make sure it's grounded. So that's one of the things I want you to do. Another thing that is not involved in your nature is procrastination. If something is your nature, it's easy for you to do and you're more motivated to do it. If something is not in your nature, it feels really heavy. So many times you'll procrastinate because it doesn't feel authentic to you, right? So I want you to kind of really examine that. And then the other thing, examine any outdated beliefs that you have. And you, if you have a belief that someone else is saying you should think this way or be this way, but it's so difficult for you, you're trying to retrofit someone else's belief in your life and that's why it's not working for you. So I want you to examine that as well. So these are all patterns that need to be examined. So really it's about accepting your nature and welcoming it in, right? And so by focusing on your worth, right? Focusing on that, this allows you to shift your pattern. It interrupts the stress hormone that your pattern continues to feed to you, right? You interrupt that and you avert that the actions that you would do from that which then allows you to divert and not fall into that sabotaging behavior, right? And so the other thing is by being able to also project with confidence, right? You're also projecting in a confident, projecting with confidence means you're secure within the relationship, right? And so we're not faking it until we make it. That's also what vulnerability is about. Vulnerability is, are you being authentic? Vulnerability is, are you being genuine? And the first person that you have to ask yourself if you're being genuine or, or authentic with is yourself. And when you're being genuine with yourself, it allows you to be genuine with other people, right? When you're accepting of yourself, you're also accepting of other people. So think of it this way, the more judgmental a person is, that is an indication that they have a lack of self-acceptance. And that's how, the, that's how they show up, right? That's how they show up. And so the other part, and we're going to have actually hop into our Q&A, is understanding how men think. And so I'm going to share with you, here are components. There are four key components of understanding how men think, right? And these are what I call the keys of mental seduction. So the first key is to have a high value woman mindset. This makes a man curious to get to know you, right? Due to your confidence. So that's the first thing. The second part is understanding how men think because this makes a man feel that you get and understand him. And so when a man feels that you get and understand him, that'll actually motivate him to understand you. The third part is if you're rocking the first two, 
high value woman mindset, understanding how men think, it will naturally eliminate sabotaging behavior, which is the third element in mental seduction, eliminating sabotaging behavior. And then the fourth element in mental seduction is being very skillful in knowing the art of conversation, right? And so when it comes to conversation, there are actually three levels of engaging conversation, charismatic, seductive, and erotic right? You use them at different times with different people in different scenarios, right? So those are the four keys of mental seduction to get into a man's head so that you can get into his heart, all right? So what I want to do to kind of close out here my talk, because I want, we do want, definitely want to get to uh, Q&A with doing this, and we'll be able to do Q&A probably like, I think maybe 15 15 minutes or so uh, getting into Q&A. So we really appreciate all of you that are here and actually more people have come on uh, the call since we started. So thank you so much uh, with that. So we wanted to share with you, Diana and I wanted to share with you what is behind the sabotage, how you can get to being secure and some um, steps that you can actually take in order to arrive to that. And one exercise I wanna leave you with, I want all the ladies to do around this, and then we're gonna go ahead and get into um, how you can get a little further and how we can go into q and I want everyone to do what I call the news exercise, right? What it is, you're gonna actually watch the news, okay? <laughs> I want you to go ahead, watch the news. And these are the questions you're gonna ask yourself. The first question you're gonna ask yourself is how do I feel when I'm watching or hearing the news? Get into the feeling state, right? This is what Diana and I were talking about. This also is to your beingness, right? Get into that feeling state. So how do you feel? Do you feel great? Does it energize you? Do you get ma mad? Do you get angry? Do you get anxious? Whatever that is. So write those feelings down. Then the next question you ask yourself is, is what I'm seeing or hearing on the news happening to me right now? Is it happening to you in that moment? Yes or no? That's all you answer, yes or no. You don't, don't, into, get, don't get into shades of gray with this one, all right? Because that is overthinking when you get into the shades of gray, yes or no, all right? So if it's not, if the feeling that comes up in you is not happening to you personally and you only see it on the TV, then here's the next question to ask yourself behind that. Then why are you feeling that way? If it's not actually personally happening to you at that moment, why are you feeling that way? And in that moment, everybody, you just realize how that feeling that you brought up is not real. It's a feeling that you've been programmed to feel and you got triggered from what you saw on the TV. This is something to help you with your triggers. This is what this exercise will do. It will help you to identify something as a trigger, then to identify, is this really going on with me? To then be able to let it go so that you don't create a mountain out of a mohill because you're not actually experiencing that at that particular time. Sometimes you may be, yes. There's a slight chance you may, but a majority of the time it is not. And so it's to actually help train you what is truly you and what is programming that you're allowing to run amok in your life, all right? So that's the exercise that I want you to use and then ask yourself, do I do that in other areas of my life? Do I do that with other people and things of that nature so you can get subtle? So with that, everybody, what, uh, Diana, you wanna go ahead and share um, you want to go ahead and share where what you have for yes, uh, for yes. ladies to go a little further. Yeah, absolutely. So there are two things. Uh, one is I invite you all to come into my free Facebook group. So this is a group. There are a few of you in here, I think, who are already part of the group. And I share so much in there. So I'm doing videos in there. I'm posting articles. I'm I'm giving a ton of information in that group and just like even facilitating sometimes some group coaching. So it's an amazing place to be. I'll just drop that link below. So this is a group just for ladies for now. Fear less love, but you can't see the less here. <laughs> okay. Fear less love with Diana. And then for those of you who really um, related to this idea of overgiving and overthinking and overdoing in your relationships, 
I'm actually hosting a six week program starting next week, May 25th. It's called Receive, a six week antidote to overgiving, overthinking and overdoing. Right, so we're really hitting that. And I'm, essentially the journey I'm taking you on over this six weeks is to understand the shadow of overgiving, the gift of setting boundaries, and then the highest expression of being in your relationship of actually stepping into that position of receiving. Okay, so I just wanna reiterate that over the six weeks, taking you through really deconditioning that belief that overgiving is the way to be in relationship. And, like really pinpointing for you why it's there and how to break it. What boundaries do you start, need to start setting for yourself and how can you uniquely step into receivership in your love life? So I will just post that below. So it's a six week program. We're gonna to meet together every week for six weeks. It's an intimate group. Um, and I look forward to having you if it's something that really resonates with you. Oh, beautiful. Stacey, take it away, Stacy. Beautiful. Um, and what I actually have for everyone is to, um, I'm doing a four week and actually this is um, free actually. So uh, it's get him to commit, right? And so I'm actually gonna be getting a whole lot deeper into the four checkpoints, right? In order to get a man's commitment. Like, so in this talk, we just talked about checkpoint number one, which was to be a man's confidant. And so uh, with this one, I'm also gonna put this in chat. It's a complimentary training that I'm doing for four weeks. And so the next checkpoint is how to be a man's uh, sex symbol and why you wanna be your man's sex symbol. And then how to get into a man's and be in a man's castle and how to be into a man's heart so that you can receive the commitment that you desire and that you deserve. So for those four weeks, uh, we're gonna be going through each uh, checkpoint in greater detail so that you can walk away with insight and get him, uh, get him to commit actually as training that comes out of my Manifest Your Man program, which is my uh, bigger uh, group coaching program. So I'm actually taking some of that wisdom out so I can actually share it here with you, uh, with the ladies. And so um, everyone that actually is um, on the call who registered for this training uh, will have access uh, to that training as well so that you continue it from here. And that is strictly com uh, complimentary to you. So I also have placed that um, in the chat um, as well. And it will, you'll have another opportunity to um, look at it with a replay that will go out um, also so that you can see some more greater details, what's involved there. So yes, with uh, Diana's group, it's a free Facebook group that you can join with her. And then for me, I'm doing the complimentary uh, free training for four weeks. And that actually gets started on June 1st uh, to do that training. So I welcome all of you there. So with that, um, so with that, why don't we go ahead and open things up for Q&A. Now, for those of you, if you have a noisy background, I want you to go ahead and put your questions um, in the chat um, and everything else. And so we'll be able to do that as well. And if you do want to actually ask us uh, the question in person, go ahead and unmute yourself because everyone has the opportunity to unmute themselves. So we're gonna be opening up for Q and A right now. So is there anything that uh, Diana and I had gone over and you have questions, then you can go ahead and ask us now. So we'd love would, to hear your questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we would definitely love to hear questions. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then say your, your name uh, and where you're from and what your question is for either myself or Diana or both of us. And we can give our respective uh, viewpoints on that. So we are now open for questions. So yes, you'll have to unmute yourself. So let's see here. Let me see if I can unmute. Does anyone have any questions? Let's see here. Sarah says, I resonated with the part where Stacy mentioned trying to be more extroverted. Beautiful. Yeah, um, that is, 
Thank you for sharing that, first of all. Um, thank you for sharing that. And the reason why Diana and I, and we share you know, our own journeys is to show you that we're not perfect. Like I said, I'm a recovering perfectionist <laughs> and things of that nature. We're not perfect. There are things that we've gone through, challenges, and that one between the introvert and extrovert, that's a huge thing that goes on because especially in American society, and I know it's not just the American society, people feel that extrovert is the golden, the golden key. And actually it's, it's not. And as an introvert, um, I think Sarah, as an introvert, you know, here's one of the benefits you have um, when it comes to being in your feminine power, because I teach women how to be charismatic leaders and then to be seductive lovers at night. So Sarah, uh, with being an introvert, um, there's, you can leverage being a quiet siren. That's what I call my introverted uh, seductive sisters, right? They're quiet sirens. So being a quiet siren, because you're an introvert, you have the ability to kind of step back and kind of see the landscape of what's going on. So what happens is um, because you do that, people have the tendency to trust what you're saying because you observe before you le leap in and do, right? So that's one of those things that can be a benefit, what I call the quiet siren. So go ahead and embrace your introvertism <laughs> and things. I don't even know if that's a word. Uh, I add and stuff. to that too. I think there's something about being an introvert that's actually like quite feminine as well, mm -hmm. uh, because part of being in that feminine energy is being like a little bit more contemplative and in that intuitive space. And so for, and not to say extroverts can't be in that space because of course you can, but in that, in that introverted space, you will typically spend a bit more time alone. And so you have that opportunity to like get intimate with yourself. And so I'd invite you, Sarah, to even just really do some reflection, do a little journaling, however you want to do it and get really honest with yourself about how being an introvert is actually so beautiful. Right. So your question is also like, how do I accept that? Like, what what are the superpowers behind you being an introvert? So you can really like anchor that into yourself. And sure, you can practice a little bit on the other end of the spectrum if you'd like to, if that feels like a growth edge for you. But definitely that full acceptance of like that it is a superpower. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for both introverts and extroverts, one of the things is you can actually even, there are different levels of introverts and there are different types of extroverts. It's not all the same. So like I'm a, considered a social introvert, right? That's what I'm considered a social introvert. So wh whichever side you're on, introvert, ex extrovert, when you learn what are the benefits of that? And then what are some of the drawbacks of that? So whatever the benefits are, plus up those benefits. And if there are certain drawbacks, just kind of minimize those and see how they can work in your, in your world, all right? And so that's part of self-acceptance. That's all part of self-acceptance because when you accept yourself, it's actually easier for you to accept someone else. And then you're less critical of the other person. Now I know, um, I think Daniela, yeah. uh, the thing is like scrolling yeah. <laughs> too fast. Okay, so I know I want, Daniela had a question. Um, yeah would love to hear about the right balance uh, between showing him I'm attracted, creating some chemistry and letting the guy chase me. Mm. All right. I love this. Cause I'm, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm all in the seduction world. So, um, and we'll both answer this. Um, yeah. And I think that'll be the best way for, for us to kind of tag team us. We'll both give our, yeah. our versions of questions and we really uh, appreciate anybody that can, that can hold on. Um, and if you have to go, this is being recorded and you can catch the rest of it. So in terms of in, in my world, um, let me first of all, give you the definition of what seduction is from a feminine power perspective. Because women um, in our society, modern society, have been brainwashed to think that seduction is manipulation. And that came, that just came about uh, with patriarchy, a lot of it, um, because seduction is very powerful. And the reason why women are naturally seductive, it's a soft skill, okay? And it's also seduction is playing off of our estrogen. That's why women are naturally seductive because it's playing off of your estrogen. That's why that's there, ladies. And if you look in the animal kingdom, in order to attract a predator, you have to seduce them. 
you have to lure them in and human beings are part of the animal kingdom. Watch National Geographic, you can see how it works, right? But as humans, we're the exact same way. So let me actually give you an example of what happened to me last week. Actually happened to me last Tuesday. So real example of this. All right, so I'm self-employed. I was actually working uh, in between appointments. I stopped off to work at a bookstore. When I walked in that bookstore, they have a cafe, like which most big, big bookstores do. So there was a cafe in the bookstore. So when I walked in the cafe in the bookstore, they have the social distancing with, with the tables. But when I walked in, I was like, ooh, he's cute. <laughs> and I saw this really good looking guy. I was like, ooh, he's cute. And then what I said to myself was, I would love to talk to him. It would be great if I could talk to him. I said that to myself, but listen to what I started with. I would love to talk with him. The reason why I said I would love is because love like is the highest vibration, like Diana said earlier. So this is why I said that I would love to talk to him, putting out that higher vibration. So what happens is I was in my love goddess persona. That's something I train and teach ladies with. So I was rocking my thing. Now here's what's interesting, ladies. I had on a knit, like a summer knit, like a jersey dress on. I had my mask on. I had no makeup on, right? So I wasn't all dolled up with makeup and all this other stuff. I had no makeup on, right? But I had my earrings. So still looking cute, my sandals and everything else. Sat down at the table. Now, there was only one other table that was close to me. This other woman was sitting there. But I had a line sight to this guy. I can see him clearly. He can see me clearly but I was sitting there doing my work. Every now and then I would see his head kind of like come up this way and go back down because it was very clear he was studying. So, but I was still putting out those vibes of, oh, it'd be nice to talk to him. That would be really, oh, he's really cute. All right, fast forward, the woman got up from the table. The person in the cafe washed off the table. And this is what happened. The dude picked up all his stuff and sat at the table that was right next to me, okay? And he didn't have to do that. He picked up all his stuff and sat right there. That is an indication and clue that he, he noticed. He noticed, he's probably a little bit interested. He wanted to get a little bit closer to see what my deal was. This is how all this works. So the reason I'm telling you this story, I want y'all to recognize it when it happens to you. And so he was studying something and I would see from my periphery, his eye gaze. So this is what I did, and this is very permissible. I, I looked up at him and I said, oh, what are you studying for? That is how I opened up the conversation. That is all I said was, what are you studying for? You create a personal connection or interaction. And what I did is I showed curiosity about him first. And I asked a question, where it wasn't a yes or no answer. Never ask yes or no answers. I asked a question that re required him to be in a conversation with me. And then boom, all of a sudden I found out he's studying for, he, he's, he's self-employed, he's an entrepreneur. He's studying for his real estate license, another license he wants to add to his arsenal. He's a single dad wanting to show his son, da -da. I learned all of this just by asking, what are you studying for, right? And then he asked me, hey, what are you working on? So I told him that. What happens is that's what you do. That's what starts the thrill of the chase. But I had to leave because I had to go to my next appointment. So I was starting to pack up, he goes, you're leaving? I'm like, oh yeah, I just stopped here. I'm on to my next appointment. And then he's like, but you're leaving? I'm like, yeah, I gotta go, <laughs> I gotta go. I wasn't trying to get his phone number. All I said was, I would love to talk to him. Did I get, did I achieve that? Yes, I did. Cause mm -hmm. that's all I wanted to do, right? And then I walked out, but I can see him literally, he was following me at, with his eyes as I was walking out straight to my car because he can see when I got in my car. That is what now, if I wanted to get his phone number, I would say something like this. 
You know what? It's been wonderful talking with you. You know, I really am so, I so admire that you're doing this and you're a single dad. You're creating a great example for your son. I would love to continue this conversation, but I have to go to my next appointment, right? So then it would go there. It's like, hey, you know, there's a way. If you want to continue this conversation, we can as well. Then from there, he will offer his number, right? And stuff like that. So take his number. And then what happens is many times I don't give mine. I just get their number. Because what happens is it then puts you in not having to sit and wait. Is he, is he going to call? Is he not going to call, right? So one, you get the number. One, you know that it's also legitimate. And then you're kind of controlling the situation. But then you call and then, or you text and you say, now you have my number. And that way you also know it's legitimate on top of it. So that is one way that you can craft that whole entire scenario to build chemistry, to allow the chase to start for you to stay in your power and for you to have a fun time. So that mm -hmm. is how you do that from a real example of happened to me last week last week and everything else. So talk about timing. So Diana, your perspective, that. your perspective. So I'm going to talk about it just from, let's say you're even uh, a little further into the connection with someone, right? So maybe you have gone on a couple of dates or whatever it might be. And I really love this idea of encouraging women to speak words of appreciation. I, I love how you do this, or it feels really good to be around you, or you, you're a really great conversationalist, or you're really sweet. You're really cute. I find this sexy on you, whatever form of compliment, but what's really important. So that's that piece of showing I'm attracted, right? So you ask the balance. So that piece of showing I'm attracted, like, I like this about you. I, I really admire this thing in you, but that the balance comes in then being able to turn around, go to my work and focus on my work, hang out with my friends and be with my friends work out and focus only on the workout it's that mental it's not just the physical space apart it's also that mental space apart right so really that balance of I'm showing you I'm attracted and I'm allowing some space for chase I'm not crazy about I'm not crazy about the term chasing right but that space for that like uh, that seduction and that chemistry right with a little bit of polarity between the masculine and feminine is to then turn around and really just live your life and create some space, show him that you know how to appreciate him, but that doesn't mean your life is all about him. This is especially important when you're starting to engage and the feelings are rising and you're starting to project like future ideas of what this could be. So curious if that is helpful for you, Daniela. I'm seeing we have um, Palisa, I hope I'm saying your name right, sharing what I've learned and what's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for me to understand that when a relationship ends or has challenges, I also have played a part. Today, I learned that I should acknowledge and apologize when at fault and to really just have fun in the world of dating. Yes, to have fun in the world of dating and to also acknowledge for sure that you're not a victim of the situation. There's a role that you play and that's really empowering. Yeah. The the what I would love to add um, to that uh, in terms of when a relationship ends and to understand the, your role in that um, one of one of the techniques that I uh, teach is called the witness perspective and that actually comes from uh, uh, ta in tantra because you know I'm a certified sex coach so um, in my my journey uh, was a lot with Tantra they call it the witness perspective if anybody here is familiar with NLP neuro-linguistic programming they call it the observer okay and NLP is called observer but in my Tantra training we call the witness perspective and so um, here's how you can use that in order to uh, get to the self-awareness so with the witness perspective you're actually replaying a past situation is if you're watching it on a TV or like you're watching us on Zoom, right? And what happens is because in what you, what's important is you look at the situation objectively and that is the key. Remove the emotion out of it for just suspend the emotion 
apart for a moment, suspend it for a moment, and look at whatever played out objectively. And then when you're looking into so this is why you have to look at it as if you're watching a TV screen. And when you're, when you're reviewing the situation or whatever happened, you will then see, okay, what was his role or the, or the person that this involved in? What was his role? Then you write down. And then you go, what was my role in this? How did I behave? What was I thinking, doing, being, leading up to that crescendo moment? And then in the middle of the crescendo moment, how was I acting? What was I saying? How was I being? And then assess there and give yourself, I call this the coming to Jesus conversation. Then really be honest with yourself where you contributed to the melee. So for example, you have bad communication skills. Because usually when I'm working, that, that's usually that's the first thing, especially when I'm working with couples, communication is, you know. So what happens is, say, for example, you're a bad communicator that contributed to, so you would say, okay, that contributed to the situation. Um, if you're feeling insecurity because you were cheated on in the past, and so you reacted this particular way, then that is something that contributed to that, right? So you then realize how you contributed to it, but you don't just stay there because that's where a lot of the blame and the shame and the guilt and all that negative itty bitty shitty committee is what I call it, shows up. So here's the other part of the witness perspective to get closure. So I think someone also even had a question about how to move on from, a, from an old relationship. So, cause this is also about how you get closure from a relationship. So now that you know, the triggering behavior, now that you know how you contributed to it and how you reacted to it, then here's what you do from there. You then go, all right, what would I do differently? That is what takes it to closure. That is what will lead you to your healing is you then have to say, what would I do differently? So one of the actions you would do differently so you're not sabotaging yourself is I'm gonna improve my communication skills. That's one thing you would, so, see, so you see, this is how all the dots, you gotta kind of connect everything, right? So you first have to be aware of what you contributed to it. Then when you're aware of what you contributed, you don't go into blame. That's called self-awareness and you say, thank you. <laughs> so you go, thank you, I have this self-awareness. Then you go into, what would I do differently? I'm gonna improve my communication skills. If I were, if I was cheated on in the past and whatever behavior came from that, then you say, okay, I need to be healed from that triggering reaction that I have. Then you know what, how, what you need to heal. And then here's, what, here's the great part of this process. When you know what you're gonna do differently, then you're not gonna be afraid of it happening in the future. Mm -hmm. That's the other important part of this. Because what happens is you're, you're figuring out your solution before the problem even comes up in the beginning. So then you're taking your anxiety out of the situation, right? You're not gonna be afraid to communicate to your new partner because you've been working on your communication skills. This is how it works. And this is how you minimize your anxiety going into a new relationship, okay? That's how you do that. So Stacey, I have um, a framework decoding your triggers. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it to all the people who have signed up. So it's just a framework of like very similar prompts to help you go through to really help you understand like what is your part and what do you want to do differently? And like, how do you want to navigate this from here? And really helping you to see it from like that bird's eye view and that larger truth perspective. Because when we are feeling triggered, it's a very narrow truth. Mm -hmm. True, right? Like they didn't respond when you sent this message, for example. That's true. But it's a very narrow perspective of the truth. And, and it's very tricky to stay in that space, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like you're a bull with a target in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot see what's on the peripheral, no. And yes. that's where we sometimes sabotage and we sabotage relationships. That could be something great because we didn't, we didn't take a moment to step out of that trigger and actually see the bigger perspective. So I'm happy to share that um, with everyone who's signed up. Yes. And it, you know, and it all goes back into um, just really understanding you. 
right? Really, really understanding you. And whether, and there's a lot of you that are still on. So if it's okay with Diana, we'll try to get as many questions answered. And if you can stay on, great. Um, and things like that, because what you just, what, what Diana kind of segueing off is something that Diana just said, um, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, sweetheart, please, please forgive me. But um, her name, I believe it's pronounced Ki or Kia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, que the commenting question for this one is, um, I really struggle with being told I was controlling in my last relationship, okay? So then the question here is what is what is the distinction? I'm trying to scroll it down um, and try to catch up. So what is the distinction between um, wanting your person to uh, change bad destructive behavior and being controlling? All right, very, very good. Um, excellent question, uh, thank you very much. So, um, it, well, here's one way. Uh, an individual, who is extremely controlling or controlling in a relationship or an individual that may have the history of feeling like they're a doormat in the relationship, they're actually two sides of the same coin. They both stem from insecurity, mm -hmm. okay? And they both, because a person that's very controlling, it's they're not trusting that the other person is gonna do their part. And here's the other way I want you to look at the controlling thing because I was also very much in that controlling energy, right? Um, and because I wore that mask and because I was afraid of getting um, hurt. Um, so I needed to direct everything. And when, when you're in that energy, you're also micromanaging God. I mean, seriously, you're, you, you put your intention out there you want this relationship, but then you say, it has to be this way. It has to go this way. It has to da, 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 da. And that is micromanaging God. So, you know, or goddess or spirit. I usually say, you know, the universe or spirit. And so that a lot of times, how do you feel when you're being micromanaged? Okay. Think, I want all of you to tap into that feeling. How do you feel when someone is micromanaging you? Because when you understand how that feels, then you know how your partner is feeling when you're controlling in the relationship, right? So that, that's one thing. Now, when it comes to shifting bad behavior, one of the things on shifting bad behavior is you also being a good example to your partner of the behavior that you would like, right? So you gotta show them what that looks like. The other thing is having clear communication not nagging, not complaining, not bitching, none of that stuff. Really clear communication that is anchored in love and understanding, not fear, control, hate, frustration, or any of that because he will tune you out. The lips are moving, but he will not hear a thing that's coming out of your mouth and stuff like that. Okay. And then the other thing you then have to also then decide to yourself, depending on whatever this bad behavior is or destructive behavior is, you then have to ask yourself and also depends on what your dynamic is. Why do you still want to be in the relationship? Is it healthy to stay in the relationship? Whether you have children with that person or not, don't make your kids as an excuse as to why you stay in a relationship because that is very damaging as well right? If there are children involved. So what happens is it depends on that dynamic, but you have to ask yourself, why are you staying in the relationship? If it's that destructive and it just depends on what level of that destruction, right? There can be abusive, which is on the, on the 10 scale of destructive. And then on the, on the bottom end of destructive, it can be, he just keeps forgetting mm -hmm. certain things, you know, or, or whatever. There's an app for that you can kind of, <laughs> you can do that. So it really kind of like depends on what that is, but um, that's what I would love to contribute to that. And then the other thing about being controlling is you're very much in your masculine energy. 
-hmm. So that's an indication that you need to drop more into your feminine energy. And I think someone had asked a question like, how can you recognize? So I want, Diana, I want you to at least give your perspective on this controlling part, and then we can get into helping ladies recognize how to balance, how to balance that. I've com- I can completely relate to this idea of trying to control. Um, it makes me think of like one relationship I was in where he had a drinking issue Uh, which only presented itself like Friday to Sunday. (laughs) And, you know, I tried to control all the pieces of his environment so that he wouldn't go into that space. I was the one going to Al-Anon meetings uh, when he wasn't even going to any meetings himself. Like if you want to talk about overperforming and overdoing, I was very much in that space. And it is a lack of trust when when we're in that control space, right? It really does symbolize a lack of trust sometimes a lack of trust. So it doesn't always mean, oh, just place your trust in your partner when they're showing you, I can't, I don't have the capacity to hold your trust, right? My partner was very clearly showing me, I don't have the capacity to hold that trust, right? So then it's trusting in myself or trusting in the universe that there is something better out there for me. That can be one example, right? So what I always love to say is you're not stuck. You're not stuck. You have, you always have choices in your relationships. You can accept things exactly as they are and really gauge within yourself. Can I really accept this just exactly how it is? Pure acceptance and love for my partner that he's on his journey to. Can I change the way I see this or approach this? Right. So like using different communication, really noticing how you're showing up in the relationship. Are you anchored in love or do you keep do you keep bringing up the pain and the fear and the doubt and the worry? Is there even any space for the change to happen? Right. Like if we keep repeating the same story, when I work with someone, for example, and they say I'm anxious, like we're going to work with that label for a moment. And then we're going to drop that label at some point, because if we keep attaching to it, we don't leave any space for a new reality to be created. Right. So are, is, are you leaving? So you, Kia, I hope we're saying your name, right. Or whoever is relating to this, are you leaving any space in the relationship for this dynamic to actually change? Can you approach this in a way that is more anchored in love or lastly, do you need to leave? Is this simply just what is what's required here for you to be put on your big girl pants and be extremely honest with yourself, put on the most honest pair of lenses you can put on and say, the truth is this relationship is just not for me. And I'm trying to control the outcome because I refuse to face that I need to, to step out of this relationship. The point is the controlling behavior is never the answer. The controlling behavior is only putting you in further competition and fear and resentment with your partner. So can you, again, accept it as it is, change the way you see it or approach it, or make the decision that this isn't the relationship for you? And, and we know that can, it's not an easy question to answer. We're, we're not, you know, Diana and I are not here to say it's real flippant, you know, to, to, to go in and do that. So we definitely don't want you to, to hear that. But what we are saying is that depending on the full landscape of what's going on, you don't have to subject yourself to that destructive behavior is, is what we're saying, yeah. all right? Um, and things like that. Um, And because, and I'm also seeing another part to the question, which is grappling with feelings of being, feeling justified in the criticism and and feeling that it's it's that particular way. And it reminded me of a a client, uh, actually a couple that I was working with and, and the gentleman, he very much was like that. And when it comes to grappling with feelings, I'm justified in the criticism, that actually is our ego that's Mm -hmm. talking okay that actually is the ego that's talking and here's how you can understand if it's your ego that's talking or if it's your inner voice that's talking 
because they feel different and they're gonna have a different conversation within yourself, okay? And, but first you have to know that behavior is, is ego. That's the first thing that you need to know there. And one of my uh, teachers, he said, ego is edging goodness out. That is, you know, he had that acronym for ego. But this is how I want you to think about ego and your inner voice. Ego is like a child that has a temper tantrum, mm -hmm. right? Like a three-year-old child that has a temper tantrum. And what happens is why do kids have a temper tantrum? Because they want to get their way. They feel they didn't get their way. So they're, you know, pitching a fit. And then they feel that if they make up, they make that scene that for somehow that's going to get them what they want. And anybody here that's a parent knows that's not the case, but that's how ego works. Okay. That's how ego works. It wants to keep you safe. It wants to keep you secure, but ego also wants to be right. Right. Ego wants to be right. And so that's why sometimes I call the itty bitty shitty committee, which is guilt, shame, fear, because all that lives in the ego. And what happens is your inner voice, that is where for women anyway, that's where your intuition lies, which is a feminine strength. Men is instinct, women is intuition, okay? We just operate it two different ways. Now, here's the difference when you know between the two, if you're operating from your intuition and your inner voice and you're reacting from ego. One thing intuition, this is what intuition does not have. Intuition doesn't have fear. Intuition does not have fear. It's like this quiet confidence of knowing. You're not sure who, what, where, when, why, but there's no anxiety in how you feel. When it comes to ego and with the criticism and all that, fear is in there. That's when you can tell where this is from. So if you get a hit about something, but the, all this fear is wrapped up in it, it's not your intuition. That, that's a reaction from your ego on the past of something else that's being hooked into it, okay? So this is, I want you to tell the difference between the two and that all whole thing is wanting to be right. So the question is, do you wanna be right or do you wanna be happy? Mm -hmm. There, there's a distinction. And part of that comes from the conversations that you're having with your partner, all right? And going through the, 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 the merry-go-round actually makes the situation devolve and dissolve. It doesn't make it, doesn't make it better and stuff like that. So that's my perspective on the, on, you know, try feeling justified, you know, around the criticism and, and everything else like that. So uh, Diana, do you have anything that you want I just to wanna add one piece to that because it's beautifully said. And, and I couldn't agree more that the ego is exactly like a child and I, and I love to see it like it is my inner child. And so I'm not trying to abandon this inner child or tell it to shut up or go away. So speaking to your ego, it's not about telling your ego to shut up or go away or that it's, or that it's sabotaging your life. life. It's about loving that child giving them the space and attention. So when you feel your ego flare up and you'll feel it in your body, it feels tense, right? Like you'll feel the blood boiling. We all feel it differently. But when you feel that flaring up, rather than it being like, oh, that's my ego. I need to put that aside. And like, where do I find my intuitive voice in this? Actually, the first step is to love all over that ego and see it like your inner child. And what does it need right now? right? Can you give it some space? Because if anyone's raised a toddler, I have a three-year-old right now, typically, so I know some toddlers, if you don't give them attention, they will kind of shrink down. But typically, if you don't respond to a toddler, they just keep saying like, mommy, 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 and it gets louder and louder and louder. So ignoring the voice of your ego isn't the answer, right? So I agree completely with Stacy that, that the feeling of being justified is is the voice of the ego but give it some attention give it some attention because inside of that you will start to heal that that need that like burning need to be right mm -hmm. and that need to be right is because we want to feel safe we want to feel safe our mind wants to know that the way it views the world is correct Right. So if, if there's a if there's any kind of threat that my perception could be wrong, then what else might you be wrong about? And that's that's really threatening to the mind and to the ego. Yes. 
So give it some space, give it some love, like fully love on it and then invite in, like once you feel like that, you know, that inner child has like calmed down, it feels soothed, right? Then you bring in the perspective of your higher self, your intuition, however you want to call it. And what is that, what is that voice telling you? And that voice is typically like present focused, very calm, might even be saying something similar, but in a completely different way. Yeah, it's in, it's what we want you also, and this is why, you know, with Diana sharing that example, you know, this is why I invite you to do that news exercise, because you'll clearly see about how we allow triggers, sometimes that have nothing to do with us to affect us. And when we're actually able to kind of have this outer body experience, right, <laughs> seeing ourselves, you know, uh, looking in, then we go, okay, wow, all right, now I, now I know what's going on, I know what I can shift and everything else. And so um, one, of the net, one of the questions or, that was on here was, how do I, and I can't remember who asked this, so I'm so sorry, um, because the scroll going like this. Um, but one of the questions um, that was asked was how can I uh, tell in terms of masculine, feminine energy and for them to work together? Um, so I can, to how, they, how do they work together? How do they work in a balanced way? I think that was the, the question. How to work it in a balanced way? question here. I'm looking, I can't find it. It, was, and it may have been in someone's <laughs> comments. You have, to, you have to scroll down and stuff. Um, so here's, here's the easiest way, um, that I can, uh, describe it, uh, to you. So, um, okay, let's do this in, let's do it in the context of, uh, in terms of controlling and being aggressive, because that's, uh, that's something that a lot of modern women, um, have gotten stuck in or been accused of, right? Um, so let's kind of, let's kind of start there. So. One of the things you can do is in terms of if you're working with a yin yang, okay? Um, what I share with my clients, the balance within yourself as a woman in order for you to be in your empowered feminine is you should be around uh, 70 to 75% in your feminine and about 25 and 30% in your masculine. Right. So like when you're looking at the yin yang symbol, that little dot. <laughs> right. So if you if on the yin yang symbol, uh, feminine energy is the black part. And then in the middle of that dark space is that white little dot. That's your masculine energy. Right. So this is why I say looking at that will, it clearly gives you a mind. So you should be 70, 75 percent in your feminine, 25, 30 masculine. All right. So then here's how you meld them together. So feminine energy is gentle power. Okay. Masculine energy is aggressive. When you combine gentle power with aggression, it turns into initiative. That's so what happens from ladies to then stay in your feminine energy. You want to take initiative. You don't want to be aggressive. So Here's, and here's like, well, how does that, you know, how can I tell if I'm taking initiative for being aggressive? How does it feel? How does it feel? Like even in your body. So think for yourself, when someone is really aggressive towards you, what does your body language do? You pull back. It's your natural body language to pull back because you want space in between yourself and the other person because aggression feels really heavy. Like you're pushing a boulder uphill. Now, let me ask you, how does initiative feel? When someone is taking the initiative to do something, like when like your man takes the initiative to give you a call, how does that feel? It feels lighter. It feels welcoming. It feels inviting. And when someone takes the initiative to do something with a lot of other people, they actually, their mind actually feels very relaxed because then it's something that they don't have to initiate and do, right? And things like that. So this is where it's like, look, what the, how does it feel? How does it, feel? so initiative feels softer. Aggressive feels heavier. 
right? So that is, I want, I only want to give one example. So that's one example. So like when I'm doing my seduction training with my ladies, this is how we're calibrating it. We're calibrating it all the whole way through. And here's how it shows up in work. Here's how it shows up in work. Whenever you do team building, exercises, whenever you have to work in collaboration with a coworker or a team, that's coming from feminine energy. All right. That's what it looks like in a workplace. It's called collaboration. It's called team building. It's called, that's one way feminine energy shows up in the workplace. And yes, and I work with ladies that are very much in their masculine energy who are male dominated professions and they're now doing it like a girl and they're getting ahead much further because they're coming from their nature. That is why, all right? So that's the, the tip I wanna give at least for that one of how you can tell of how to meld the, the two energies, how to meld the two energies together. So now you know, you're first. Yes, sure. And I'm just looking at the time. I see a question from Sarah and maybe we take one other question. Okay. Um, okay. So yes, to all of that. I also want it for, if there's any resistance about why should I be 70% in my feminine and 25, 30 in my masculine, at the end of the day, the question is, do you desire a counterpart in your life who is more in their masculine? Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if the answer is yes, then that's where we're putting together that yin and yang concept right? Like, do you desire to play the more feminine, relaxed receiving role and have a partner who shows up more in his masculine? Then that's when you want to create that balance of you being more in your feminine, leaving space for him to be more in the masculine. And I completely agree that besides looking at the list of qualities between the two, right? So like you can even print them out and, and have them as a legend. It's a feeling in your body. Are you leaning more forward are you more in the initiation? Are you more in the planning? Are you more in the doing? Are you more in the strategizing? Or do you actually spend time in contemplation and reflection? Do you ask your intuition questions? Um, do you actually allow people to do for you sometimes and just receive that? Right, so I really love to, like I'll, I'll even check in with my body. Sometimes when I'm even in the context of my business, if I'm in the middle of a launch or something, I'm like, hold on one second. How much have I been outputting versus just like, you know, leaning back? And I'll use my body and I'll feel, I'm like, you've been doing a lot of movement forward. It's time for you to like take a day off, put it aside and leave the trust in the universe. And I love to practice being in a relationship with a man as being in a relationship with the universe. Right, so I've made my request. Can I just trust for it to deliver? Or do I need to keep checking in like, are you done yet? Are you doing it right? Have you done it this way? <laughs> or like the kids in the car, are we there yet? Are, are we, we there, there yet? yet? Exactly. Are we there yet? <laughs> yeah. So I see a question from Sarah. Um, how do I get over a fear of being taken for granted by a partner or their interest fading? especially in the context that he's been spending lesser time with me than before. So I can so relate to this. Like I said, this is like how I operated. I, I, I operated most of my romantic life before this relationship in an anxious attachment, right? So those are some of the thought patterns of someone who, who has anxious attachment tendencies. And it's okay to know that because it can, you can learn about it and really get like clues as to when you're showing up more in that anxiety. The truth is you're not going to get over it in a couple of days. <laughs> and like, you know, maybe using some modalities like hypnosis to like rewire some beliefs um, and rewire some, even some memories that from a lot of it stems from our childhood where we were afraid someone wasn't going to show up yeah. because there was this one moment where, you know, or more than one moment where your, where your primary caretaker wasn't there when you really needed them. And all you internalize that as is like, I'm not safe. I'm not being taken care of. They don't want to be here for me. I'm alone. They're going to leave. So once again, bringing so much love to that inner child who has those fear, those fears, I'm going to be taken for granted. His interest is going to fade because he's not spending as much time with me, right? Like really doing that inner work mixed with the outer work, right? So the inner work being 
you might have a picture of yourself at a specific age that you can remember that maybe some of these feelings started to surface right, and write to her and, and see what she needs and connect with her in meditation or in journaling and look at her and, and really start to, so this is more like the long game, right, is really healing for her that original wound that makes her come back to these thought patterns, right, that makes her keep coming back in every relationship to, he's going to leave, he's going to take me for granted, and then start to notice how you bring those beliefs into the actual relationship, right? Which of your actions are rooted in um, that anxiety? So when you're, when you're getting in touch with him, for example, is it from the place of, I need to remind him I exist so he doesn't forget and he doesn't leave? You're gonna wanna dial that back. And instead turn towards yourself and turn towards that inner child and say, you're okay, you are safe. And this is very much like somatic therapy. It's like bringing those fragmented pieces back together so that you can feel that safety in your body. And then you'll actually start to show up in your relationship as someone who fully knows I'm amazing. Of course you're sticking around. And watch how he wants to spend more time with you and, and, and how he responds to you differently. So there's a lot I could say on this topic. There is so much, but I'm going to hand it over to Stacey and see what, what you'd love to add. Yeah, like like um, you said, what Diana even just said, it's, it's one, wherever you are, you didn't get this way overnight. So give yourself some grace and give yourself some kindness by being patient with yourself as you evolve out of it. Uh, and this is why when I'm coaching, I always tell people you're not broken, right? You're, you're not broken and you have to put yourself together like a vase in all the pieces. This is all about just elevating you, healing apart, elevating you and evolving to the next level of where you need to be, which is being kinder to yourself. Now, there are a couple of things or a lot of things that are, that are baked um, into this. But from my perspective, one of the first things also to look at, and I, it may seem like a broken record, but it really goes down to also self-worth as the first place. Because being taken for granted also is a value issue or proposition. Now, when I say value issue or proposition, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about surface stuff. I'm talking about this is how men think. So Women think in terms of quality. That's why women are very descriptive about so many things, but men think in terms of value. They get right to the point, right? And so what happens is to keep a, to keep a man's attention as well, it sort of, it goes back to that mind power. It goes back into how is he thinking about you and what position are you in his world? But that first is involves you getting good with you first, right? That's always the first thing because then when you get involved with you first and you get the healing with you first, what happens is you then value yourself. And when you value yourself, your partner will also see the value in you. And so with the full landscape, especially of the man code uh, formula, it starts with that mental seduction plus your sex appeal. And that's the first part of the formula. Because when you're working those first two parts, that makes a man feel good about himself when he is in your presence. Most women want to feel safe in a man's presence right? Because that's what, what's on a woman, most women's mind. They want to feel safe in a man's presence for them to continue to move forward. The questions that we've been getting asked demonstrates that very clearly. But men, that is something totally different. And it goes to the second part of your question about keeping his attention. In order to keep a man's attention, he has to continue to feel good about himself when he's with you. And as long as he continues to feel good about himself when he's with you, it'll keep it going, which then leads into the second part of the formula, which is the physical intimacy 
And I'm not talking about sex when it comes to physical intimacy. Physical intimacy, he lets you into his world, his home, his friends, his work environment. He lets you, his social circles, right? That is the physical intimacy in addition to the touchy-touchy-feely-feely stuff that's going on as well. But then it leads to that. And then the emotional connection is door number four, right? The emotional connection, that's when you're in his heart. That is when he's into, that's when the family, right? So that's when deeper family stuff comes in. That's when he's more, he's more open being vulnerable. And ladies, this may surprise you, but men learn to be vulnerable by watching you. Mm-hmm. Amen. Remember that men learn to be vulnerable and express how they feel by watching and studying you. And it goes back to what I said in the very beginning, it's biology. It is biology. Men have deep feelings, just like women do. They just have a different route. They have to go in order to tap into it and to get there and to express it. Because men aren't necessarily given uh, a safe place to express their emotions. They're not. Just like women are many times or don't, don't feel they have a safe place to express their sexuality, which are the main hormones in each person respectively. And we feel wonky about it, right? So this is where, you know, in, in keeping the, the fire alive long-term, that's with the mental breadcrumbs. That's by continuing to be your man's, you know, sex symbol. Because if you're not, he's getting it from someplace else, right? But what happens is it really does start with you. So that is what I would, you know, add, you know, to, to that part with, um, you know, the fear of being taken for granted and then where, where the interest is fading. And so I think that's a good place for us to conclude because, <laughs> uh, and thank you. So there is, there is actually quite a few of you that have, have stayed on for the entire time. So, you know, thank you very much around that. And, um, you know, thank you so much, Diana, first of all, for, uh, you know, co-facilitating uh, this wow. with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything else. Uh, it was a continuation from uh, the Juicy Love Summit because we got a lot of feedback from that. And so hopefully uh, many of you have found value in uh, what we presented here to you today. Um, if you want to also go further, by all means, take advantage of what Diana shared with you. Take advantage of what I shared with you, and you'll be able to access uh, both of those things respectively um, on the replay uh, email that you will receive. But what we can also do, at least for everyone that's still here, um, Diana, why don't you go ahead and yeah. post your link again? And yeah. I posted the link to uh, get him to commit, uh, which is my 30 day uh, complimentary training. So we can go deeper into the code so you can get that commitment uh, yourself. And then Diana's gonna put in the chat uh, to get access to hers as well. So, this is where you can her. join me. Yes, um, there just you go. Group, and then this is the program about moving out of overgiving right here. All right, awesome. So, with that, everybody, um, I'm saying. Uh, Namaste from Namaste. Orlando, Florida, <laughs> and everything else. So thank you so much. I'll turn it over. Much back. love to you, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to staying connected. All right. Namaste, everybody. We are complete, and have a wonderful and wonderful day.